check, check. Fuck yeah. Check, check. Is this thing working? Can you guys hear me? Omaha, I am fucking pumped to be here. You guys have no idea. When I touched down, I told Caleb, I was like, man, the one word that is coming to mind for Omaha is charming. And he goes, damn it. He goes, I was going for more like badassery. So that's, uh, that's what's going on. That's Omaha's badass. Can we give it up for Caleb, Shayla, and Melanie, please, the team just putting it together. Thank you guys so much. Really done a great job. So I'm going to be sharing my entrepreneurial journey with you guys. Uh, I don't have any slides, just doing it raw, straight up. And uh, hopefully you guys can, I can uh, share some things that you, may resonate with you. So first thing is first, I come from a family of immigrants. My parents immigrated here from the Dominican Republic. And that's had such a strong shaping factor to my story. Uh, we grew up pretty broke. My parents had crummy jobs. You know, my mom cleaned toilets for a living. She was a custodian. And my dad was a presser at a dry cleaner. Um, but, and so anyhow, I was raised in Florida. And eventually, I moved to the Big Apple because I wanted to be the world's greatest jazz musician. That was my big goal. Uh, and once there, I was working a bunch of dead-end jobs uh, to help make ends meet. Uh, and then my luck began to change when I started working as a doorman. And I often say that opening up doors for people open up doors for me. And here's where I, the, big, the biggest takeaway I've had from my parents uh, kind of kick-started my career. And that is they taught me, well, I'll, I'll give a little backstory. I, as a little kid, I would go into where my, where my pops worked. So he's a presser, so you can imagine. It's like a sweatshop, and he's in the back, and he's pressing garments. And I would go there for, I don't know, couple bucks so I can get a slice of pizza or something. And there was one time in particular when I went, and he was pressing a blazer, OK? And he said, son, come look at this blazer. And I, I really just wanted to get the hell out of there because I wanted some pizza. Uh, but he opened the blazer, and on the inside of the blazer, there was uh, a couple of wrinkles. And so he said, son, I could send this out, and the customer would never know because it's on the inside. But and he steamed it out and it was really smooth. And he said, but I press it out because I know it's there. And so he said, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. And that really clicked. And so when I was a doorman, I was the best damn doorman you could find. I learned your name, your kids' names, your pets' names. When I would see you come, and no one would have to tell me anything, right? I'd get your clothes ready in your boxes and your packages. And I do it with a smile, and I do it genuinely. And this kind of energy that you put out, uh, life begins to reflect it back to you. Um, and so I started building genuine relationships with the residents. And so here's where it all got started for me. One of the residents in particular said, John, you seem like a smart kid. Why don't I offer you a business opportunity? And for him, he had made his fortune with a chain of dry cleaners. And he's a dude who comes from the streets, you know, and he wasn't shy about his money. He wore a fitted, and he had like a beamer, and he ro rolled with like a rollie on his wrist. Um, real cool dude, it got really close to him. And so here was the premise. He said, okay, look, I have a dry cleaning facility. I'll give you wholesale rates without you having wholesale volume. So in other words, a blazer, again, would cost you guys about $7 to dry clean. He gave me a $2 rate. So all I had to do was just go out and convince someone to give me their clothes. And uh, I'd bring it to him. He'd clean it. I'd bring it back. And I made the difference. I said, OK, cool. I can mess with that. So the, the very beginning of the business was just me going to other doormen saying, hey, my name's John Henry. And I would go with my cheap suit and my cheap briefcase and my cheap business cards and say, you know, I'm a doorman too. And I know that you're the key to the building. And you know, I know that residents complain to you for every, uh, every time their, their dry cleaning goes wrong. So I'll slip you 20 beans for every customer you can get me. And, uh, and so I, I learned something valuable, and that is that relationships with people is really one of the most important things that you can have. And so at first, they were skeptical. I was 18, and I would show up every day. And then slowly but surely, you begin to win people over. And I would get them a cup of coffee, and would that cost me a dollar? But would that do? It built a relationship with them. 
And slowly but surely, I started getting customers from these doormen. I was like, okay, cool. I'm learning something here. And I didn't really hit the gold until one of the residents in particular, I was getting ready to quit my job. I wanted out of there. I don't make a great employee. And uh, yeah, I was looking for all different ways to like innovate the experience of the building. Fucking management doesn't want that. They just want someone who's going to follow instructions. <laughs> so so uh, one of the residents, I told him, I was like, bro, I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm leaving in January. He's like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to start a dry cleaner. So you're going to start a what? I'm going to start a mobile dry cleaner. And he said, wow, dude, I've been in film and TV the past 25 years, and we have yet to find a single dry cleaner that can meet our crazy demands. Because we, we film at night, and most cleaners close by 7. What time do you get off? I said 11. Boom, 11. He picked me up and took me onto the set of what became my first movie, which was The Wolf of Wall Street. So I met Leonardo DiCaprio and Scorsese. But more importantly, I met the wardrobe supervisor. And he was. <laughs> And he was grilling me, and he was asking me all these questions, and I was really trying to keep up. But at the end, I was like, dude, I don't know. Um, but I promise you, I'm going to work so hard. I'm going to work harder than anyone that you've ever you know, worked with. And uh, so months passed, and my boys were ragging on me. They're like, how, where's Leo now? Because right? I was bragging about me doing Leo's clothes. And um, as luck would have it, it's, it's, as luck would have it, I got fired. In De in, on December, right? And that really blows, because as a doorman, Christmas is like when you make a big chunk of change, and then I was going to quit. That was the plan. So I was waiting to you know, jump off the cliff, but I got kicked off the ledge. I was fired. But the very next day, it just so happens, I, got, I get a call from the Wolf of Wall Street, and he goes, hey, you still ready to do those clothes? I said, you bet your ass I am. And so I went. And I did The Wolf of Wall Street, and we did great. And after that, he said, hey, look, I really enjoyed working with you. There's another account in town. If you get them, you're going to be OK for a long time. I'll make the introduction. So he calls them, Boardwalk Empire, <laughs> snagged it. Law and Order, <laughs> snagged it. Person of Interest, <laughs> White Collar, Unforgettables, Amazing Spider-Man 2, Ninja Turtles, and it goes on and on. And we ended up dominating at least 85% of the film and the TV industry. And that was really what got, uh, that's, that's really where we made our bread and butter. And so I learned a super important business lesson from that experience, and that is that there's riches in niches. There's riches in niches. So while everyone was killing themselves going for $40 transactions, we were, each account brought us seventy-five dollars to $100,000 in just a couple of months, and we were the only players in the space. And so when you're a startup, you're pressed for resources, man. Don't try to boil the ocean. It's far too broad. Instead, pick a small pond and do a really good job there. And the key, the telltale sign for niches is that individuals know individuals. So the other wardrobe supervisors would hang out with the other ones, would hang out with the other ones, and they would refer me. And slowly but surely, I broke onto the scene. So anyhow, I did that for uh, two years. It was great. We expanded into housekeeping and dog walking. Uh, which was a terrible mistake. I don't even like dogs. Um, <laughs> but uh, then about a year and a half into the business, we were making enough money. I put up a storefront. And then I brought on a CTO. And then, uh, you know, we, then we had software and stuff. So I say that I had an on-demand laundry startup. But you know, it really started with me walking through the subway system in New York, knocking on your door, picking up your laundry sack that weighed more than me, going down the train, across, all the way into Brooklyn, bringing it to Hugo so he could clean it, waiting for it, and then lugging it all the way back. Right? So that's hustle. That's hustle. And I think that you know, Saul was talking about work-life balance. In my experience, in my experience, like that shit doesn't exist when you start. When you start, you better be working all the time, all the time. You, you make it who you are, because your work, we're entering a different uh, era now where our work is not separate from who we are. Our work is who, who we are, what we do, what we believe in, if you're doing things that you care about. And so that experience with my first company jaded, uh, jaded me for the rest of my now professional life, because it was such an intense period. And so after about two years, um, one of, we had multiple vendors at the time, and it was really great. We had a team of 13 people. And uh, one of the vendors that we were working with was acquired by a larger company. 
And eventually, they were looking at their charts, and they said, well, who's this guy who's growing quickly? Uh, and he's tech-enabled, and all the other guys were um, not growing. And so he made me the offer to sell my company. And so we hashed it out. And December 3rd, 2014, I sold uh, Mobile City to a gentleman named Rudy. Um, and so from that point on is where kind of co-found Harlem, uh, which is the project that I'm now working on, has its inception. So when Mobile City was growing, we headquartered it. We were in the center of Harlem. I love Harlem, man. It's, it's so cool. It's, uh, it's like the only community in New York where you know the milkman and the male lady, and you know all the owners of all the restaurants. And like, you can see guys like wearing three-piece suits and fedoras, like walk in and snap in, and there's jazz playing. And there's like the gospel ladies with the big old hats. Like, it's legit. It's really cool. And I fell in love with Harlem. And once, once I sold, I, I thought, you know, I could take a little vacation, um, but, but I wanted to get involved with, with, uh, with the neighborhood. And I knew that uh, it just so happened I had two co-founders my prior CTO and, and another guy, um, we came together and we decided that we would do something fascinating for Harlem. And, and so what became of that is co-found Harlem. And so here's what we arrived. Here's the premise. We were going to invest in companies. So we we're going to put the bid out and ask for companies from anywhere and everywhere. And we we're going to invest in them. And uh, the, the really interesting twist and what has made us so well known is that we took zero, we take zero equity. Okay, zero, okay, donuts, Cheerios, Fruity Loops, nothing, right? We take zero equity. But here's the one thing that we do ask. We ask the companies to make a commitment to headquarter in Harlem for a period of four years after the initial nine-month program. So the way you pay us is you stay right here in the neighborhood that we care about, and you hire people from the community, and you train people in the community, and you expand here, and you grow here, and you, you, know, you rep Harlem. You become part of who we are. And, um, and so that, you know, that's, a pretty bold, that's a pretty bold fucking task for three 20-something-year-olds to just say we're going to invest and we're not going to take anything. And, and there's, a re there's a legit old guard in Harlem. There's a legit old guard. And I remember the first time I got cursed out by someone who had been running a not-for-profit in Harlem. Uh, I turned to my buddies, I was like, bro, we made it, right? We made it. He's like, when, when you, like Tanya was talking about um, the, the, the companies, uh, the manufacturers, like, were um, pissed at her because she's doing something different. When someone's upset at you, you're doing something right. When someone's fucking pissed, you're doing it right. And so we knew that we entered into a new space. And so what we did was when we invest in companies, we put them through a nine-month program, mentorship, free office space, and 50,000, again, zero equity. And you stay with us for this nine-month program, and then you grow here. So we just finished our first nine-month cohort. We invested in four companies, and here's what we saw. One of the companies failed, which really sucks, and I kind of took it, uh, it, you know, I took it to chess, it sucks. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, one of the companies ended up, ended up raising more venture capital, and they're continuing to grow. And they're now the largest music online collaboration community in the world. They're called bandhub.com. Um, so you can play music with people all around the world together. So we have two extremes. And then we have two companies that are growing slowly but steadily. Um, and so there have been a few very interesting and key takeaways that I've had with my experience at CoFound. Um, one of them is that, is that mission things, ideas that have uh, a mission-driven component resonate far deeper, in my experience, than, than something that's just purely uh, about financial return. When, when I speak to someone and I tell them about COPA and I tell them that we take zero equity and what have you, I can see them light up in their eyes. And that resonates with them, and they want to tell people about what we're doing, and they become emotionally invested in the project. And you know, they join your funnel, and they tell people about what you do. And it, it's a really fascinating thing because when we started we had so little resources and we were able to grow as quickly as we have because people give a shit about the mission right so the second thing was that we we got really creative about value exchange and so we offered companies free space but we didn't own any real estate 
So what we did was we convinced, there was a, a Jewish real estate developer in the neighborhood, really well-known guy, and uh, I remember everyone had told me, I have to meet Yoav, I have to meet Yoav, I, you know, he's the guy for you. And I wrote down in my notepad, I said, I'm going to meet Yoav. And it just so happened, the very next day I was at the bank, and I had just Googled him so I saw what he looked like. And I was handling my business, and I look over, and sure enough, this guy, Yoav, pulls up next to me. I was like, oh, fuck, that's the guy. <laughs> and, and like, I see that he walks over to the, <laughs> to the customer service desk, and I like, cancel what I'm doing with the teller. I was like, forget it, forget it, forget it. And I like, pack my stuff, and I like, walk over next to him. And you know, I was just doing my stuff. I was like, are you, are you Yoav from, from Artemis? And so we struck up conversation, and I had a 30-second opportunity to just pitch him. And I did, and I landed the meeting. And so what I told him was, I said, hey, we want 4,000 square feet of office space, and we want that shit for free. <laughs> and he was like, why would I do that? And I said, well, if these companies are committing to stay here for the course of four years, and they're, they're making a physical, written, legal commitment to stay in Harlem, and they got to go somewhere, and you own all the land, I think it behooves you to make it easy on me to do this. And so a light bulb went off in his head, and thankfully he was progressive enough to really understand. And so we formed this strategic partnership. But that was a super key lesson for me here, and perhaps uh, it may resonate with you as well. It's like whenever you don't have resources, find some way that you can deliver value to someone that would make them want to give you what it is that you want. And so it just so happened that he had a bunch, he had a big open space just like this, and uh, you know he put us in there, and he said, "All right, John." He said, you have a year to make this shit work. And uh, you know, I, I couldn't call on him for anything. Like, he was pretty hands off, but he gave me the space that I needed to really get going. And so now a strange thing happened. After the nine month cohort, we, we, uh, we finished the program and I made a big announcement to all of our, uh, the people in our network and our press and what have you. And then it was time to hit the streets and fundraise. Now, CoFund Harlem is a non for profit. And I really hate fundraising for a not-for-profit. It feels a lot like I'm sticking my hand out. And I'm a for-profit kind of dude anyways. And so it, it didn't feel right. And this is when one of my mentors said, John, you guys are doing a good job creating valuable companies. There's no reason that you can't do well and do good at the same time. You can do well and do good at the same time. And so he said, why don't you raise an actual venture capital fund? And it was just one of those moments where you know, it was like a single thing that he said to me that really got me uh, thinking. It was, I was pondering it. And, and I had made such a brand for being a non-for-profit guy at this point, so I was hesitant to let that old image go. But I knew in my heart that that was the way to complete the pipeline. And so we went out there. And we hustled. And um, we, we did end up raising a small $8 million fund called CoFound Ventures. And so now the idea is we're going to take, so we still have this non-for-profit where we have all these companies coming through. And then we have CoFound Ventures that puts money into them. Uh, we double down on the, on the winners. And they stay in Harlem. And they grow. Um, and so with that said, it's. This is where I'm at now in my professional trajectory. It's been a fucking awesome ride. Um, and I feel like uh, for, those, for those of you considering starting something, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of talk about product market fit and you know, accelerators and like, uh, marketing and shit like that. But the most important thing is hustle first. You have to want it so bad so bad. And the, the key lesson that, that I'll leave you guys with is that most people think that seeing is believing. But that's a skeptical attitude. Because then you're only dominated by what you can see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. But I believe that believing is seeing. First, you have to see it in your mind and believe it so strongly so strongly, just emanating off of you, that physical reality has no choice but to catch up. Believing is seeing. And so if you're a founder and you're in the audience, and you, believe, and you know what? I, 
I also have been hearing a lot about like that founders went out and like really wanted to solve a problem, and that's fucking fantastic. But when I started my first company, there was no problem that I wanted to solve. I didn't want to change the world. Like I just wanted to be in business for myself, and that's enough too, man. Like if you just want to be in control of your own destiny and start a company, that's cool too. You don't need to, you know, generate clean water for Africa or any. Like you just if you just want to do it and it's burning within you, please know that you can. And all you have to do is just take a step, man. Take a step. And so that's all I have for you guys. Thank you guys so much. Killed it. Love it. Thanks, man. You got okay. time for Q&A? Yeah. Okay, right there. Yeah, let me grab this water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, we only got time for a couple questions, so don't be passive. If you got a burning question or some feedback for uh, John, would you get up right now, get to the mic uh, quickly. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, primo, te tengo una pregunta. Dímelo. <laughs> uh, really, you're an inspiration. I'm barely 19, just finished my freshman year at college. I just want to know, as a young person, what would you recommend are the skills I should really develop uh, young so I can really kick ass in the future? I think that all the skills that you're going to need, you're going to develop as you go along, man. I think what's important is for you to double down on what you're currently good at and not give a shit about what you're not good at, right? So for me, it just so happened that uh, I, have a, I had an ability to be persuasive and go out there and be in your face, and so I doubled down on that, and that's what got me my wins. But you know, if you assess your own personality and you're more of an organizer, so I'm terrible at bookkeeping and accounts. That's, like my, that's my least favorite part of running a business. You know, if that happens to be uh, which you will ex excel at, then you can form a team around you there. But um, I, would spend, I wouldn't spend that much time uh, on developing uh, skills. I would, just, I would just double down on what you're already good at. That's my take. Go ahead. Hey, John. Love hey. to talk. What's up, T? Um, I have a question. Do you ever get burned out? And if you get burned out, how do you stay inspired? That's a good question. You know, uh, I rocked for like, t I rocked for like two, three years without burning out. And all these people were talking about burning out. I was like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Like, <laughs> like it's, it's just a mental weakness. Like, you're just soft, right? <laughs> and, and then like, I legit. I By the way, can I interrupt? That yeah. would be an incredible book. Like, if you wrote <laughs> that, like, you let that hit the market. Like, there's nothing on the market like that. Like, stop being soft as hell. Like, that would go, that could really go places, man. Right? I, I like yeah. that. I yeah. Like, so, um, but then, like, I legitimately burned out. Um, and it happened, like, fairly recently. It was maybe, it was at the beginning, it was at the turn of this year, man. And I just, I couldn't get myself to answer an email. I didn't go to the fucking office. I wasn't writing, you know. I, Normally I write every morning. I wasn't doing anything, anything related to work. And so perhaps there's some reason to what Saul is saying after all, man. And I was going to the cafes and just chilling there at 2 p.m. And it, would, it was so weird for people to not see me go, 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 go all the time. Um, and so I, I think now that the past two years, something that I've done just personally is I've taken on meditation. And I do it, I do it two times a day. I do it in the morning and in the nighttime. And I just spend 10, 15 minutes just breathing um, and just uh, nurturing my capacity to be grateful for what is. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a huge help. But for the most part, man, it, fuck it. Like, just do it. And like, <laughs> no, seriously, like, I, people are afraid to burn out. But if you don't know what it feels like to burn out, then you haven't reached that threshold, you know? So like, go hard until you burn out. And then you'll know if you like it or not. And then you can assess your weaknesses, you know? So that's, I don't know, that's how I feel. Thanks, Steve. Three book deals. You're gonna burn the hell out. Do meditation. Stop being soft. Stop being soft as hell and repeat. I love it. Hi there. I was wondering, um, with like a world full of opportunities and I don't know, distractions, and there, there's a lot of pressure, especially people our age, to do a lot right now and to have a lot on your plate instead of focusing on one per, one one thing per se sure um what is your advice around that and i know you've said meditation and those kinds of things but how mm -hmm. do you hash through opportunities 
Yeah, well, what's interesting is you're catching me at an interesting time. This is the first time in my life where I'm running four projects at once. Um, so this would be a good time to say eBay is experimenting with doing, uh, they're doing their first ever national podcast. It's called Open for Business. Uh, and they asked me to be the host, so I'm hosting that. Um, so you guys will see that uh, in the next coming weeks. Uh, but anyhow, so I'm doing that, and I'm also doing a real estate tech venture capital fund with my partners um, who come from the Rose family, and I'm doing co-found Harlem and co-found Ventures. And I actually, I don't like, I don't like doing all these things at once. Like, I think there's so much value to just doubling down on one thing and pouring your all into it. Um, and so, I mean, you asked me for advice. I think that... I think that my advice when people ask me for advice is not to listen to so much advice. Um, seriously, I think that there is, uh, there's a driving, you know, at the, end of the, at the end of the day when you go to sleep and it's just you, yourself, and you, you have to live with the decisions that you make. And no one really knows every facet of the situation like you do. And so when people give you insight, you know, it's, it's only from like a five to 10 minute interaction that you have with them. It's a very limited insight. And so, um, so I, think, I think to just double down on what it is that really gets you fired up, and I think that that's what will give you the best results. Thanks for your question. Hey, what's up, homie? Yeah. Uh, my name is Byron. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, I have not experienced as much energy as you in the last you know, half hour, so that was awesome. And I think I speak for everyone here. Can we just come to Harlem and hang out with you? Yeah. What? Yeah. That would be dope, <laughs> really, man. That's really all I wanted to know was can we just come and hang out? You know, it's funny. I was speaking in Aruba, and a bunch of Arubans uh, did end up taking a trip to Harlem. And they stayed with me, and I showed them around. So like in Omaha has the same invitation to my place. I definitely want to do that. So. <laughs> that's very cool. Four years is a long time to commit to a specific city. What if a company said, you know, I just really need to be in Omaha for my business? What do you do in that situation? That's a great question. Um, the four years thing was super arbitrary, man. Like, peep, and so, you know, we've gotten press, and when you get press, like, you get solidified as, like, a thought leader, as an expert, but in reality, like, we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We just came up with that number, and we thought, hey, look, that's a reasonable time to commit. But we do get pushback. Uh, and we get pushback from great founders. And this whole thing can't work unless you have great founders. Um, and so we're currently in the middle of exploring alternative ways that, that companies can, can get involved. Right? So does it matter if you're in a place? What if you're headquartered in another place, but you uh, still commit to hiring? And even hiring from a, a community is very difficult. So we're, we're faced with a big task, and right now our goal is to invest in 100 companies uh, by 2020. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a pretty ambitious goal. Um, but to your point, um, which, what was your question again? It was... Uh, if they didn't want to be there all four years. Right. Um, so we will never, ever do anything to stifle a company, because we're entrepreneurs, for entrepreneurs, by entrepreneurs, everything. And so if you have a legitimate reason where you say, hey, look, the market that I need to be in is in Omaha for whatever reason, then we would let you go. I got, yep. a, qu I got a question. So What's you're that? from Florida. I am. Well, I'm from New York originally, went to Florida, right, and then came back. Have you been in Harlem? How many years have you spent time in Harlem now? Well, um, I headquartered my first company in Harlem. I've been there for maybe three years, okay, two, cool. three years. So not all that long, and people ask me why I rep Harlem, but man, when you fall in love with something, you just yep. do, man. Yep. It, just, it just really resonated with me, and it was the only neighborhood in New York that I feel like really had a sense of community. Yep. And so I knew that I wanted to get involved in it. Um, and talk about riches and niches, man. Like, I was able to carve out a lane. So everyone knows that, you know, John and, and his co-founders, Evan and Heisha, like, we rep uptown. Yeah. And so it was, it was fascinating to carve a very clear distinction, and we're in our own lane now. Yeah. And so I think that entrepreneurs should be, like, again, riches and niches. So start with something super specific. So if you're a photographer, not good enough. If you're a, photog a dog photographer, that's better. If you're a Dalmatian photographer, even better. You want to be the first name that's, that, that comes to mind when, when someone thinks of a thing. Yeah. 
And so when it comes to uptown, like we just dominate that, yeah, and I've been awesome. I've been enjoying that. That's yeah. really really cool. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned was the strength of the community, but the pushback on that could be I'm jumping into a community or a space that's so interconnected, I'm going to feel like an outsider. So you've done something to become an insider in that community. Yeah. Where people are championing you, saying we would rather give you free space to keep you here. Right. So coach us just relationally. What did you do to become an insider in a culture? You know. I think that the most important thing I did was gave a shit. Yeah. Like and. And that sounds strange, but this, I really mean that. And people like, you know, I see people networking and like, it's fascinating to me. People will come up to me and say, hey, what's your name? Great, here's a card. And then they just leave. It's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, <laughs> like awesome. listen to me, right? Interact with me. Be more interested yeah. and interesting. And, and, and so I feel like that can happen anywhere. And so when I got to Harlem, when I was at the bar, I would speak to the bartender and say, hey, man, like, what's going on? Like, what do you do outside of here? Oh, you're a musician? Shit, me too. I play guitar. And so we would nurture a relationship. And so if you do that and you over-index and you do it over the long period of time, people are like, man, I like that kid, John. He's yeah. really cool. Yeah. And so you begin to get these relationships, and then eventually you win the politicians over and, and the bureaucrats, and, the, and you form, uh, you, you help them yeah. foster community. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're excited to have you there. Yeah. That's really, really Hey, what's cool. up, man? What's up, homie? So, uh, your knowledge drop was just profound, man. It was Thanks, great. Thanks, brother. Um, your father, I could tell he was a very wise man. I wouldn't be surprised if he made you read the book of Proverbs maybe three times. <laughs> yeah. It was deep. I appreciated it. Awesome. Um, my question is, is after your success, uh, how, do you, how do you keep uh, your success from uh, affecting the relationships around you? Like, you're, you're a man who's very well integrated in the community. You probably have a lot of relationships everywhere and now that you've achieved so much success um, you probably have people coming at you from every every other way how do you keep that from affecting the relationships around you well I just want to clarify I don't think I'm successful yet I don't think that there's ever this moment where uh, I'm gonna achieve something and say I'm successful you know I think that um, I've just been enjoying the journey and going along and and thankfully, like the, the things that I'm deciding to tackle are a little bit bigger every time, right? So at first, my, my biggest challenge was like, can I clean your dirty laundry, right? And then it was like, can I clean the dirty laundry for a movie and for five movies? And then you keep going and going. And so, um, so there's that. But the, the truth is I do a pretty shitty job at it, you know? Like I, I do have some relationships that I haven't been tending to. And people hit me up and say, oh, he's too big for his britches now. And, um, and so I think that I have to do a better job. It gets difficult, man. I don't know. Does anyone here have the answer? No, like, I, just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to keep nurturing these relationships. It gets, it gets very difficult to scale. It gets very time intensive, resource intensive. And so the things that I do, I actually, and you know, maybe it's because of how young I am in my trajectory, but I pull back and I spend time with my family and I spend time with you know, the, the, those closest to me and that's how I deal with it. Yeah, you're not going to be able to maintain a thousand relationships. It's, you it's pick tough, your, man. Yep, it's yep, tough, man. It's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Can you guys give this guy a standing applause? Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming all the way down here. You crushed it. Thank what you. energy to this thing. Thank, thank you. you so much, John Henry. Appreciate it. All right.